Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. I got an email from Anonymous, subject line, 40 years, BYU football perfect season. Hello Jared, thank you for all you do. Please note, I am not a BYU football fan by any means. Go Aggies. If you're outside of Utah, the Aggies are Utah State University. However, I find it very interesting uh, that BYU is having a perfect start to their season now 8-0. On the 40th anniversary of the year, they went undefeated and won the national championship. They also have a Jewish quarterback who said one of their wins was a quote-unquote spiritual experience. Surely this will bring more attention to the church, similar to the 2002 and 2034 Olympics, as all things denote there is a God. Keep up the great work. Yeah, so I've heard a little bit about this, but I guess now it's time to do a video about it, thanks to Anonymous. And uh, my mind instantly goes to a couple of things. So there, there's kind of a lot to think about with this. So number one, you might think it's silly talking about a sport, you know, football and the second coming or spiritual things. But I'll remind you that there's a wide variety of people on this planet. For some people, sports is everything. For other people, uh, say you take someone that's a very religious Jew, for them, their religion is everything. And I think the Lord speaks to each one of us in ways that we understand. Okay? And I don't think that you're a bad person if you really love sports. Uh, I think it can get unhealthy when uh, you have it uh, too high up on your priority list and you spend a lot of time with it over other things you probably should be doing. But we have a lot of good members of the church that are athletes and just fans, and, and it's okay. It's okay to have an escape. So for some people, sports is a big deal, and the Lord can use that to communicate with them in a way that they understand. And I feel like we had an example of that earlier this year with the Super Bowl, where you had the Kansas City Chiefs, play against the San Francisco 49ers in Las Vegas. Now, there was so much to that Super Bowl, so much. I'm not going to repeat it all here, but let me just give you a couple of the key points. Kansas City, the Kansas City metro area, is where the New Jerusalem is going to be. Independence, Missouri is a suburb of Kansas City, so... If it was the New Jerusalem metro area, it would be essentially the New Jerusalem Chiefs, okay? If you think it's silly, it's fine. Maybe this video is not for you. But for some people, this makes sense. And what happened was you had the Chiefs that played. So they they, they kind of represent, they come from a part of the country uh, called the Heartland. <clears throat> think about President Nelson. He was a heart surgeon. He's working on the heart of the church. And uh, when he did his special area devotional for Kansas and Oklahoma, he pointed that out. He said, <coughs> excuse me, he said, you are in what's called the heartland of America. And then he used that as like an object lesson. So you have this city that's in the center of the continent or pretty near the center. It's the heartland. Um, it's more rural, you know, and then you have this other city and this is nothing against San Francisco. But San Francisco does have a past, and it's known for certain things, and um, typically they aren't good things. There, there are a lot of good things about San Francisco. But overall, you don't really view it, I don't think, as like a spiritual center of the nation. In fact, it's probably at the very bottom of the list, along with some other cities. And interestingly, San Francisco played Kansas City in a city that is officially, its official nickname is Sin City. Okay? So we looked at the Super Bowl through the lens of it being like a foreshadowing of the second coming in Christ's victory over this world. You had San Francisco, and they were playing in Sin City, and there was just so much to that game. So like I said, I'm not going to do a comprehensive thing here, but I'll, I'll put a link for the video I did in the description box below and also the live stream right afterwards, because the way that it ended was pretty miraculous. And this actually ties in to what we're about, what we're about to talk about 
with uh, BYU. Uh, because this game was won in overtime. And President Nelson has talked about the fact that we're in the last half of the ninth inning, which is a baseball analogy. And I think a lot of us can get discouraged when we look at the world and how worldly people are coming, uh, how worldly people are becoming, uh, even members of the church. Uh, there, there seems to be more and more separation between those that are faithful and those who are not. And it may feel like we're losing, right? And there's definitely opponents of the church that try and convince you of that. I get that all the time on my TikTok account. But it may appear that we're losing, but we know what the final outcome is going to be. We know who wins the game, and it's Christ and his church. Okay, so I felt like the way that the Super Bowl went, went was very symbolic and very meaningful, and I do believe it was a type of foreshadowing. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to BYU. Let's first talk about this. In the April 2024 General Conference, President Nelson gave a talk called Rejoice in the Gift of Priesthood Keys. He said, My dear brothers and sisters, today is an historic day for President Dallin H. Oaks and me. It was 40 years ago. Okay, 40 years. So 1984, 2024. On April 7th, 1984, when we were sustained to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And then he adds a footnote, and uh, we already knew about this story before this talk, but I'm glad that he mentioned this because, look, look at this. I filled the vacancy in the Quorum of the Twelve left by the January 11th, 1983, death of Elder Legrand Richards. So he's, he's including the date of his death. Okay, that's a little bit unusual. Elder Oaks filled that which was left by the January 11th, 1984, death of Mark E. Peterson. So the two apostles that they replaced died exactly a year apart. And I've done a, I've done a video about the number 11 and 111 and stuff like that. So what was going on, and I'm sorry for those of you that already know this, but there's always new people joining. It was a very interesting year, 1983. Okay, President Kimball was not doing very well. And there were a couple of general conferences that went by where this spot was not filled. The spot left behind by Elder Legrand Richards. So April general conference, October general conference, no one was called. Okay. And so that was unusual, and uh, President Kimball wasn't well enough to do it, and so people were really starting to wonder, what are we going to do if he passes away? <clears throat> and then you have the passing of, uh, I think he was president, like in the quorum, of the, he was in the first presidency, President Marky e. Peterson. <clears throat> and then it's like, oh, well, now we have two spots that need to be filled. Well, thankfully, President Kimball came to for a little bit and he told President Gordon B. Hinckley to call President Nelson and President President Oaks in that order, quote unquote. Okay. And so that's how that's their story of becoming uh, apostles. Uh, in between these two deaths, there was this unusual flood in downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, it got really close to the temple. And I've done videos about that before. The the downtown Salt Lake flood of 1983. Just, just look it up. You'll find, you know, plenty on that. So I feel like these things highlight President Nelson and President Oaks. They came in together, which has happened before a number of times. But in the year that they were, that they came in, President Hinckley mentioned in his president, in his uh, general conference talk that it had been some time. It had been 40 years since we had two new apostles, like at that time in 1984. And the last two, uh, if I remember right, were President Kimball and President Ezra Taft Benson. That was 40 years before President Oaks and President Nelson. Okay, so 40, 40, here we are. We're on the other side of these 40 years. And now we need to look at the number 40. What does it mean? Well, in the scriptures, 
usually what happens is you have a period of 40 units of time, and then after that comes destruction. Okay? 40 years of, like, preparation. Uh, when I talked to Rabbi Gerfine, he said in Judaism they look at it as, like, an incubation time, like a time of growing, incubation, preparation. So you have the 40 days and 40 nights of rain, and then after that came the flood or the destruction of the world. Okay? Um Moses was on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights, both times that he received the tablets uh, with the Ten Commandments. After the 40 days, the gold calf, which you could look at that as a symbol of worldliness and and wickedness, was destroyed and 3,000 put to death. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after leaving Egypt. They then possessed the land after the 40 years have been completed. And we all know that as they possessed the land, they destroyed the cities that were already there because they were wicked, starting with Jericho. And I've talked about how the story of Jericho, that's the first time that you see seven trumpets. And I feel like that story is a foreshadowing of the second coming, but I've done videos about, about that before um, where we went into the details. Uh, Christ fasted for 40 days. Uh, when he was with God in the desert, after the 40-day fast, Christ is tempted by Satan, then Satan is cast out. And Christ begins his mortal ministry, which culminated in the atonement where he overcame death and sin. Okay, um, and there's more. Um, Christ spent 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection, and then after that, he ascended to heaven the Salt Lake Temple uh, was under construction 40 years. And once that was complete, when it was dedicated, that's when the four angels of Revelation chapter 7 were released. And I have those quotes right here. This is my spreadsheet called Quotes Numbers. So you can access my spreadsheets anytime. <clears throat> the link is in the description box of each video. Okay. 40 years under construction. And then the angels of destruction were released with the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple. And then of course, 40 month or 40 weeks 40 that's a long pregnancy. 40 weeks is the typical length of a pregnancy. And then my last example is what we just talked about with President Nelson and President Oaks when they were called. And uh the quote by President Hinckley is right here that I was talking about. You can pause right now and then read it if that's what you'd like to do. Okay, so it's necessary to talk about that because we're talking about BYU having a perfect season in 1984, and it hasn't happened again until this year, 2024, the same year that President Nelson and President Oaks reaches their 40-year anniversary as apostles. Okay, so... Let's move on to the next thing before we talk about that. Uh, the first thing that I wondered when I started hearing this story was, was that the same year that, that w there was the, um, the Miracle Bowl? So I don't know if this plays in to what we're talking about now, because we're, we're actually talking about the 1984 football season. But in case you didn't know, <clears throat> this is something that I've known all growing up. Um, the 1980, so just four years before, the 1980 Holiday Bowl was a college football bowl game played December 19th, 1980 in San Diego, California. The game is famous due to a furious fourth quarter rally. Okay, now look, that's like the Super Bowl this year, how it seemed, <coughs> excuse me, it seemed like, um, you know, the Lord's team, <laughs> that sounds really bad, but it seemed like the Lord's team, so to speak. <clears throat> is behind, but then they come back at the end and they win. The game is famous due to a furious fourth quarter rally, including a last second miracle, quote unquote, touchdown that gave BYU a 46 to 45 victory over SMU. Thus, the game is known as the Miracle Bowl, especially among BYU fans. The 1980 Holiday Bowl pitted Brigham Young University against Southern Methodist University. Of, of all teams, another religious university. 
Okay, game summary. BYU had never won a bowl game in school history, having lost the 1974 Fiesta Bowl and 1976 Tangerine Bowl, as well as the, f- the first two Holiday Bowls in 1978 and 1979. For the first 56 minutes of the 1980 Holiday Bowl, it seemed the Cougars were headed for another defeat. And then at the end, uh, BYU scored 21 points in the last two minutes and 33 seconds which if you're not familiar with American football, that's a lot of points for that amount of time. Uh, It's obviously doable, but it is a bit more on on the miraculous side, okay? So you had that, okay? And now four years later, um, here's all all of BYU's football uh, seasons. 1984, 13-0. Okay. Um, this is back when they were part when they were part of the Western Athletic Conference. Uh, it keeps changing. I'm not sure why you have all these like different conference changes. I, I assume it has to do with money mostly, maybe politics as well. I have no idea. After that, they were part of the Mountain West Conference. That's what I'm the most familiar with because I was a teenager at the time. Um, and then they were independent, right? And then they joined the Big Twelve. And that's how it is right now. Okay. So here is, um, here's the 1984, you know, lineup and how all those games went. Um, there was something that stuck out to me on here. Uh, I can't remember. Whatever. So you see that they won all the games. Okay. They won every game that year, 1984. Um, oh, I meant to have this tab over here. If you want to watch uh, the key parts of the Miracle Bowl, it's here on YouTube. I'll put a link for this video in the description box below. This is posted by Da Punky QB. <laughs> so maybe you can like subscribe to his channel, uh, see what what other content he has. Okay. And then uh, here, here is this season uh, for 2024. Okay. So they've played Southern Illinois. Uh, which is kind of interesting because Nauvoo, let's see, wouldn't Nauvoo be considered in uh, Southern Illinois? I want to say yes. Let's take a look. No. No, it's not. (laughs) It's not at all. Okay, we'll forget that. Just forget it. And then after that, their second game was against uh, SMU. That's the Southern Methodist University University that they played in uh, 1980 in the Holiday Bowl right here, Southern Methodist University. I don't know how many times they played them, but maybe if you follow BYU, you can let me know how often they play SMU. But and then Wyoming and then Kansas State. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay this year for BYU to beat Kansas. But not that I'm a Kansas State fan. If anything, I'd, I'd be a, a Kansas University fan, and that's coming up on the 16th. Um, and then Baylor, and then Arizona, Oklahoma State, uh, UCF. What is that? University of Central Florida. And then the next game is going to be the, the University of Utah, um, and that's always a big deal. If you're not familiar with these these college football teams and BYU and Utah. <clears throat> there's a huge rivalry between the two. <clears throat> the University of Utah, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the University of Utah is in the Salt Lake Valley. That's the main university there. And then south in Utah Valley, that's where you have BYU. And so there's like a, a rivalry. And then they're going to play Kansas and then Arizona State and then Houston. Okay. So it's not over yet. We'll have to see how it goes. But, uh, I never really watch college football. I don't have time for it. The only time that I have to watch any football game is the Super Bowl. Otherwise, I don't have time for this stuff. But this year, I think I'm a little bit more invested in what happens with BYU. I think I'm going to be rooting for BYU this year, even though they're going to be playing Kansas. Um, And I was going to go to the University of Utah, but plans changed. And they changed for the better, but I would have gone to the U. Okay. Now, let's talk about this um, spiritual experience 
by the the quarterback Jake uh, Retzlaff or sorry Retzlaff. I'm sure. How's it pronounced? Jake Retzlaff. I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced. Um, on his Wikipedia page at the bottom, it says Retzlaff is Jewish. In 2023, he became the first ever Jewish quarterback to play at BYU. <laughs> Interesting uh, time for that to happen. So for the first time ever, we have a Jewish quarterback at BYU. After 40 years, having another perfect season. And uh, yeah. And then he's number 12. Of course he is. The 12 tribes, right? <laughs> I mean, you always have like this number range for quarterbacks and wide receivers and linemen and whatever, but still it didn't have to be 12. It could have been something else, but 12. Okay. This is, this is, I feel like something's going on here. I feel like something's going on. Um, oh, speaking of the 2002 Olympics, he was born in 2002, uh, basically just right after the Olympics. Because the Olympics, I believe, were like in February. Okay. And then uh, you have this article uh, by KSL Sports. How BYU kept undefeated season alive with quote-unquote spiritual drive <laughs> over over Oklahoma <laughs> Oklahoma State. That's I, I'm not sure I've ever heard a, a drive called a, a spiritual drive before. But I guess it makes sense for this game. Provo, Utah, BYU football had 73 seconds. Score a touchdown or the undefeated dream was over. Number 13, BYU trailed Oklahoma State 35 to 31 with one minute and 30 and 13 seconds remaining after Pokes uh, quarterback Alan Bowman connected with Brendan Presley on a 60 yard touchdown to cap off a 17 play drive. Okay. Oh, that's for the other team. I'm not going to. I don't need to highlight that. I was like 17, you know, for President Nelson, the 17th president of the church. But that's the other side. At that moment, it appeared BYU's magical run was ending in front of a sold out Friday night crowd. However, like everything with the 2024 edition of BYU football, the players and coaches had different plans than what everyone else was thinking. Yeah, just like the church right now. Just like the church and uh, the Lord's Youth Battalion. Uh, what I believe is the final team that's up to bat uh, before the second coming and probably the transition team, the first missionaries of the millennium. Okay, BYU put together a game-winning drive that finished with quarterback Jake Retzlaff finding wide receiver Darius Lassiter for a touchdown to give BYU a 38-35 to victory. That drive highlighted the wild twists and turns of the game, but also the resilience of the now 7-0 Cougars. Retzlaff said, everybody believed it. That's powerful. I like that. Because you know what? At the second coming, everybody's going to believe it. Not not that they're going to accept Christ or um, not that they're going to convert and join the church, but everyone is going to acknowledge his um, his kingdom and that he's in charge during the millennium. Everyone is going to at least believe that. I love, okay, continuing with the quote, I love two-minute drill. The best situation I love is two-minute drill. Okay, and then later on, I think I had some more at the bottom here. BYU football delivered a quote-unquote spiritual experience. The highlight-grabbing receiver has been revising his best plays at BYU uh, quite often since he arrived in the spring of 2023, but this one has to go to the top. When Retzlaff took the podium to speak with the media in the wee hours of Saturday morning, he called it a spiritual experience. Retzlaff said, It's magical, spiritual. How can you not be romantic about this game? And that's it. And uh, and by the way, I know... I thought about this uh they're in a conference called the big 12 you know going along with this whole thing that he's number 12 but they're in the big 12 conference so (laughs) i'm a little bit excited uh to be honest i really am they are now eight and oh who were the last ones that they played again oh yeah ucf uh university of central florida 
and next up is Utah. So, so you guys, um, I don't care if you're a University of Utah fan. The correct choice, the right choice, is to support BYU this year uh, because something magical is happening. Okay, uh, if I can do it for Kansas and for Utah, because I, I Utah's also you know my, one of my top teams, then you can do it too. Okay. Well, thank you, Anonymous, for the email. Um, let's just see what happens. And seriously, seriously, if you haven't watched it, please go watch my Super Bowl video. There was so much more going on with that. Another thing I should have pointed out at the beginning is that the uh, head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs is a member of the church, Andy Reid. He's a member of the church. There, there are weird things going on this year with sports. There really is. Okay, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.